And this is the Stella Culinary School podcast found online at StellaCulinary.com. My name is Jacob Burton. Thank you so much for joining me in today's episode. I got a lot of great stuff planned for you, but you know, I was going back and forth thinking about what we were going to talk about today. And I figured it is actually time to get back to basics, to put y'all back to work. So the last handful of episodes have been great Q&A episodes, which I love. I love the interaction uh, with the uh, community, also AKA the students, right? A lot of great info being passed back and forth. But I think what we need to do is we need to jump back in almost from the beginning and start uh, from the basics because I have a lot of people who uh, in this group have gone through my online culinary boot camp series. And whether you've done it or not, it will be helpful for you for your cooking in general and also to just better understand me and my teachings. Uh, but you don't have to go through the boot camp to kind of play along at home. But what we're going to start doing is we're going to start talking of and incorporating the F-step process and the F-step philosophy uh, into some uh, broader technique discussions. And then uh, you're going to get some homework assignment, right? You've been getting off easy for far too long, so we're going to uh, hand out some assignments at the end of the episode, and then we will start talking about uh, your questions and comments at the end. So if you have some questions, feel free to drop your questions and comments into the live stream as we go, uh, and I will uh, review them as we discuss current topics, uh, and then we'll also just do a, a rapid-fire Q&A uh, towards the end of the segment. Sound good? All right, let's get started. So when you first uh, start the culinary boot camp, or what I call the F-step curriculum, and the reason why we call it F-step is because the, the five basic steps to creating a dish and really learning about cooking in general, right? So you have flavor, which is always first, right? Sauce, which is second. Technique, execution, and preparation, right? So after you've gone through the flavor, sauce, technique, and execution in your head, and we've talked a lot about execution in the past, Right, And we're going to talk more about it. In fact, I'm taking all of these different uh, execution segments, I'm chopping them up, and we're going to have an execution playlist on the Stella Culinary Live YouTube channel. But after you think through the execution, then do you step into your kitchen and actually start cooking. Right, You start your preparation phase. So you're prepping, 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 because you already have your execution planned out. So the question is, when you first start to learn about flavor structure, what is the best way to put that into action? And there's any number of ways that you can do, any number of dishes that you can create. But really what I want people to grasp in that first segment of flavor structure, even before they first go all the way through that video, is the balancing of the basic flavors, right? Because that is the canvas, that is the foundation upon which uh, everything else is built. So even if you have a really unique flavor structure, right, meaning uh, unique spices, unique herbs, uh, high-end ingredients like truffles or you know any sort of uh, it's something that you spend a lot of money on, if you don't have that balance, if your balance is out of whack, if it's not seasoned properly with the proper amount of salt, proper amount of acid, uh, proper amount of bitter to kind of cut through some fat, right, some fat for some uh, mouthfeel, then you're going to have a, an unbalanced dish, and it's just not going to hit home. It's going to taste, well, not professional, right? And that's why everyone tunes into this, whether you're a home cook or a professional cook, is how to cook on a professional level. So what I want to do is we are going to bring back the Stella Culinary Challenge, but we're going to bring it back more in a homework-style uh, assignment, all right? And so what I want you to do is I want you to uh, go online, go to uh, youtube.com slash Jacob Burton and search out F is for flavor. And I have the first, I think like 45 minutes of the, my flavor structure lecture on there. So you don't actually need to, need to purchase the boot camp uh, to learn about the, the basics of, of flavor structure, right? Because what I want you to do uh, in this homework assignment is the basic balancing of flavors, Okay. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working with a Greek salad, but a Greek salad as a concept. So let's talk about the Greek salad here for a second, and let's talk about the actual tr traditional salad, uh, and we'll kind of incorporate these two um, I ideas together. 
All right, so first of all, uh, in Greece, there's no such thing as a Greek salad, right? It, it's basically uh, what they would refer to as a farmer's salad, and they take the freshest vegetables they have, toss them in some good olive oil after they chop them up, a little bit of feta cheese for some fat, and then any number of other ingredients, maybe a little bit of oregano, sometimes a little bit of lemon juice for their acid, okay? Um, and that's how I like to make uh, my Greek salad. Uh, I'm not a big fan of salad greens in a Greek salad. I think it kind of takes away from it. Also, too, the salad greens uh, tend to get kind of soggy. Now, what this exercise is going to do is it's going to allow you to uh, practice a couple of things that are really important, some fundamental skills. So we're starting from the base, and we're going to start building you up, okay? So when I make my Greek salad and in, in a traditional Greek salad, a lot of times you will julienne the vegetables. And to get a nice, even julienne of vegetables, it's really important for you to have good, solid knife skills, right? So the professional pinch grip on your knife, uh, not holding it like a hammer, right? And using your guide hand technique. So for those of you who actually uh, need a little bit of a review on this, go ahead and head on over to stellaculinary.com slash CKS. And that stands for Culinary Knife Skills. And I'll go ahead and, and for my uh, live viewers, I will actually, not CKSS. For my live viewers, I will pull this up on the screen uh, real quick. All right. We'll go ahead and expand this because it could get a little confusing. So CKS, and I place them in the order in which uh, you should you know, watch them, right? So how to secure your cutting board, how to hold a chef's knife. So this is your professional pinch grip, all right? And then how to use your guide hand. So these are re the real important um, aspects that you want to be paying attention to uh, when you're going through and cutting your vegetables for your Greek salad, all right? And then for the actual julienne, we have a video on how to julienne an onion, uh, you can uh, throw in some minced herbs, right? How to cut a bell pepper, also how to seed and slice a cucumber. So all the videos that you need uh, are right here in this resource for you, uh, stellacorn.com slash CKS. And so what I want you to do, I want you to find some vegetables, and I want you to uh, julienne them up. Now, traditionally speaking, right, in, in my and I, I shouldn't, I, I actually, I shouldn't use the phrase traditionally speaking because nothing I do is really traditional. Everything I do is inspired by tradition, right? And uh, that's how I like to cook. Uh, you can kind of create your own cooking style, right? Um, but I like to be inspired by things. So I'm inspired by the Greek salad. I'm inspired by the fact that they use fresh vegetables and they use a great olive oil and they use that basic, uh, uh, very simple flavor balancing uh, that we talked about in uh, F is for flavor, all right? So what you want to do is you want to take your vegetables, you want to slice them up, and I want you to really focus on your julienne technique and your professional knife grip, right? Your pinch grip, your claw grip, right? Having the claw hand guiding your knife, the, edge, the side of your knife is always in contact uh, with your uh, first uh, knuckle on either your uh, index finger or I like to use my middle finger because my longest finger, right? So, And I want you to really focus on getting that motion down. Uh, I can't, uh, it, it's, it's, it's always boggles my mind uh, how many people have a lot of years of experience uh, cooking and they don't have proper knife skill technique. And it's really holding them back, not only on the accuracy of their cuts, but in their fluidity of motion throughout the kitchen, right? We've been talking, again, a lot about execution. The better you are at your basic prep techniques, the faster you're able to be able to execute, Right. And so if I can chop an onion faster than you, if I can chop a cucumber faster than you, if I can butcher a chicken faster than you, that means I have more time in my day to do more prep, which means I can prepare for more complex dishes. So if you want to actually be able to execute more complex dishes, you got to start from the basics and you got to get your prep skills down. You got to get your efficiency down. Having speedy knife skills is one of the, the fastest ways to get there, right? By having that good guide hand technique, by having the good grip. All right, so you're going to take your vegetables, cucumbers, onions, uh, bell peppers, uh, whatever other hard vegetables that you want, and you're going to do a nice thin julienne on them, right? And this is just step one. This is just option number one, 
okay? Because I want you to view this more as a, as a concept. Now that you have your vegetables in this bowl, let's talk about our, our flavor structure. The process or the steps in which you add uh, the seasonings to your ingredients uh, are going to affect how that salad actually eats. So for me, the first thing I like to do is in that bowl, I actually like to add my feta cheese. And this can be you know anything that you want. You can leave the cheese out completely. But the reason why I like to add my feta cheese first, even before my olive oil, is during that mixing process, once I add the olive oil, the feta cheese breaks down a little bit uh, into the olive oil and acts as a coating, right? So it's almost taking... Uh, that olive oil, and it's thinning it out uh, into a, a coating-like uh, sauce, for lack of a better term. Now, in a traditional uh, salad dressing, right, when you're actually dressing a salad in a traditional manner, uh, which I will pull up here, um, I have a – we can probably go ahead and mute this. So I have a video. If you just go to uh, – youtube.com slash Jacob Burton. I have a video on how to dress a salad and it's, it's really, really simple, right? But what you're doing is you're just basically adding your greens, uh, to, to the bowl, right? And you always add your oil first because that oil basically creates a, a nice, even coating on the, on the leaves. And then you're using the rest of your ingredients to actually season. So here I'm just using, a normal, uh, you know, mescaline mix, right, or a field greens mix. And uh, here I'm just using some hazelnut oil, right? And, again, that's a, a, that's a flavor structure decision, okay? The actual active ingredient, what we're doing is we're cutting our, we're coating our greens with oil here. But once they're evenly coated, the actual oil that you choose can be anything you want. So it can be olive oil. It could be hazelnut oil. So here I'm seasoning with acid, which is a Moscato, you know, Moscato vinegar. But this, again, it could be lemon juice. It could be sherry vinegar. It can be anything you want. Now I'm seasoning, right? Now we know that we need salt. But here I'm using flirticel because the flirticel has that nice little crunch, nice little pop of texture. And then I have my, uh, my cracked black pepper. And then from here, you just putting on a plate and you're garnishing with ingredients. I throw in some candy nuts. I throw in, uh, you know, a, a few other things. And um, that's your basic salad dressing, right? That's how you dress a, a salad in a in a basic sense. So the same thing holds true well, with your Greek salad, okay? What you want to do is you want to start by dressing the, the uh, vegetables. Oh, that picture in picture doesn't look good. You want to start by uh, dressing the vegetables first with your feta and with your olive oil, and you want to add enough of that good olive oil or whatever other oil you want to evenly coat those vegetables. Now, what do we know about fat? Well, fat will actually coat your palate, okay, and it will uh, deaden some flavor, so you need some brightness there. So how do we cut through fat? Well, there's a couple of ways to cut through. The number one way is acid, and you should always use acid in almost every single dish that you create, right? There's always going to need to be a little bit of acid, whether it's a touch of lemon juice or uh, vinegar, and there's always going to be some exceptions to this. But for the most part, you should always be thinking, uh, you know, people think salt and pepper, right? Salt is a seasoning, pepper is a flavoring. Really what you should be thinking is salt and acid, salt and acid, right? Because those are the two things that are really going to brighten up your dishes. So after you coat your vegetables uh, with this olive oil or whatever oil you choose, you want to then sprinkle in some acid. And again, you're not making like a two to one or a three to one traditional vinaigrette. You're taking that acid, you're splashing it in to cut through the fat. So what I want you to do is when you dress your vegetables, first, taste the vegetables raw, okay? Take a bite of your bell pepper, take a bite of your cucumber, take a bite of your tomato, whatever it is that you're throwing in there. And then I want you to dress them with some oil. Take another bite. Notice the difference. Notice how that oil will sort of deaden the flavor, but also bring some roundness to it, right? And that's why the oil is there in the first place, because also with fat, we know that there's... a uh, quite a few of the complex flavors that we taste are actually based from aroma, right? You have the basic sensations that you get on your palate, but a lot of the actual complexity of your flavor comes from your olfactory system, right? Your actual, your sense of smell. 
most of those volatile aroma molecules are only fat soluble. So if you have a dish completely devoid of fat, you're going to be losing out on some flavor. So you add in some fat to your veg to your vegetables, which have almost no fat or really none, right? And then you want to rebalance that fat. You want to bring back that brightness with some acid. So again, traditionally, a little squeeze of lemon juice will do the trick, right? A little sprinkle of uh, sherry vinegar, if you like it. Moscato, I like Moscato vinegar, whatever vinegar you like, right? So now you have that fat and acid balance. Now taste again, right? Again, a little sprinkle, a couple of drops, mix, taste, a couple more drops, mix, taste, right? It shouldn't taste overly sour. You should see that brightness coming back. Now, if you add too much vinegar, meaning that it's too sour, right? Cool. Great job. Good learning lesson, right? As we talked about in the past, you have to base it. You, you can't be uh, scared of failure, right? Uh, there is a great question that we'll kind of address a little bit later on uh, in, in the broadcast um, about, uh, you know, if you're cooking a dish for the first time, uh, how do you know if your flavors are on point, right? And not to get to the punchline there, but really what you want to be looking for when you're uh, dressing your food is you're going to have to sometimes push that envelope too far. You're going to have to know what it tastes like when you not only under salt a dish, but over salt a dish. When you add too much salt, when you add too much vinegar, when you add too much oil, right? But to kind of keep you in the guidelines, it's your julienne vegetables dressed with your oil, a little shake a shake of some vinegar, and that's going to brighten everything up. Now, once you taste that those vegetables again in each stage and you're tasting that brightness, you want to go ahead and sprinkle in some salt. All right, uh, Fleurcell is great here because it's a cold application. So you could use a finishing salt because once you break that salt down, right, once you drop it into, you know, hot water, it just becomes sodium chloride, right? The re reason why you pay the premium uh, for Fleur de Sel or Malden Sea Salt or different salts with different crystal structures is because of the actual textural component and how that how that changes your dish. So if you have a finishing salt, use it. If not, you know, a good sprinkle of kosher salt will be fine. You can use some cracked black pepper if you want a little bit of a, a peppery taste. And then from there, kind of add what you want. Now, this is a really good base for you to not only drill your knife skills, all right, but also to practice your base flavor structure of balancing fat, acid, and salt, right? They're all, that will always be there, okay? From there, you can then say, well, okay, now that I understand this concept, what's keeping me from taking this exact same concept uh, and maybe instead of cutting them julienne, uh, cross-cutting that julienne into a dice, right? And now I take that and I uh, dress it with some olive oil or whatever uh, fat that you want, hit it with some vinegar or whatever acid that you want, and now you have something that resembles more like a salsa or a chutney, right? And let's not get too far in the weeds of the technical terms of, well, a salsa is really this and a chutney is really this, okay? What we're talking about is the same basic conceptual approach, right, where you have your, your now your diced vegetables that you dress, you create that flavor structure on top, and then you put it maybe as a sauce, right? And so, so now, so let's say I take my Greek salad, I make it and I pan roast a chicken or I pan roast salmon, okay? So this is gonna be part of your actual homework assignment is adding a protein of choice, right? To kind of get you in that mind frame of, of cooking a, a, a quick lean protein and executing a, basically a, a, a salad with a protein, which is gonna be great coming up here uh, in, in the spring and summer months. Right, But then you can take that concept further because now you understand this basic concept. And now to drill your actual knife skills, right? instead of drilling uh, your julienne, let's go ahead and drill your dice. So go back through, and now you want to dice your veg. Okay? You want to uh, cross-cut whatever it is. Right, uh, your, uh, you, know, you can practice your onion dice, which is a separate technique from your bell pepper dice, and so on and so forth. Take that, you dress it. Okay, now maybe I'm leaning a little more uh, Asian style, right? So I'm going to add in a little bit of sesame oil, and maybe I throw in a little uh, thwack of some XO sauce, and that gives me that nice sort of fishy chewiness. And then I'm going to balance that with a little bit of, uh, you know, black vinegar or, or something, right? So you can see how you can, you know, just quickly lean into different directions by the, changing up the actual ingredients that you're putting in here, Right. Uh, you could dice. You could start dicing up some fruit, right? So the same concept. Maybe you take some pineapple and some mango and uh, a little bit of tomato. 
you seed the tomato, you dice everything up, you seed and uh, and skin a cucumber, dice that up. Now you have sort of this fresh sort of pineapple mango salsa, right? That's following the exact same concept of the Greek salad concept, right? Where you're taking your vegetables or you're taking your fruits, you're dicing them up, and then you're going through that flavor structure pattern of, and it's really important to, to do the steps correctly, right? Fat first, because you want to get that coating. You want to add that fat. You want to get that flavor from it, right? That roundness that sits on your palate. Next, you want to cut that fat. You want to bring that brightness back. So you want to add in a little bit of acid. Finally, a little touch of salt. And then from there, you can go crazy. You can finish with herbs. You can finish with some pepper. And sometimes we'll taste something in a kitchen uh, you know, a, a chef or a cook will bring me something and say, uh, hey, wh what does this soup need? Does it need salt? Does it need acid? Does it need some more fat? And sometimes the answer is, well, it kind of needs more of everything, right? Like the whole thing is just, it's balanced, but it's flat. It's like listening to, a, you know, a well-produced song, but just your radio is kind of turned down. Right, you don't need to bring the drums up. You don't need to bring the uh, the the banjo up or whatever. You got to bring the entire track up, right? So you just got to crank up the music. So sometimes you go back through that entire cycle where it's like, okay, it's just it's all tasting a little bit flat, but it's well balanced, right? So let's add some more fat, add some more acid, add some more salt. So for your homework assignment uh, this week, and we will be reviewing them uh, next week and this week, and this is something you could easily get done in a weekend is I want you to, at the, at the very base, if you're um, you know, feeling uninspired as far as ingredient choice, look up a Greek salad, right, uh, and, and list the ingredients, which uh, are, are basically just some hard, crunchy vegetables that don't need to be uh, blanched, and then go through that seasoning process. Then I want you to add a protein on top, and then for a bonus, you could add some sort of sauce, but really you don't need a sauce because the protein or the uh, the olive oil and the vegetables uh, that you dressed, right, will also work as a, a sauce. It'll bring moisture uh, to that dish. So one of my favorite things to add on top of my Greek salad is a pan-roasted chicken breast, uh, pan-roasted salmon, or a grilled shrimp or sautéed shrimp. Now, if you go to StellaCorner.com slash CT, that's StellaCorner.com slash CT, that stands for cooking technique. Uh, that's where I keep all my cooking technique videos. We do have a video there on pan roasting a, a chicken breast and pan roasting salmon. I don't have one on shrimp, but shrimp is pretty easy. Nice thing about shrimp is it has a built-in timer, right? Throw it on the grill, throw it on the pan. Uh, when the shrimp is uh, pink on both sides, you're just ready to go, right? Pink and firm, and, uh, and you're all set. Right now, if you want to push the envelope with that, uh, you can then take this concept of dicing your vegetables, julienning your vegetables, doing a very fine shave julienne, and then creating a garnish with that. And then maybe you have a separate underlier. Now, I'm not going to go too far into that because I don't want to overly influence the more advanced students uh, if they want to play along at home. However, uh, this weekend, I will be... Uh, shooting video on this, and I will be getting a video out to the main channel uh, by next week. So while you guys are working on your homework assignment, I will also be doing my version of the homework assignment. Yes, I will be playing along with you as well, uh, and I will be uh, and and don't you know don't expect some smoke and mirrors sort of craziness. Um, I'm just planning on doing a really basic. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see how the inspiration strikes, but it's going to be more for more of an, an instructional for the overall concept. And then maybe we'll do a, a play on something that would be a little bit more uh, at home in a uh, fine dining dish. All right. So is everyone clear on the uh, on the homework assignment for this week? No. Yeah. So again, what you're really going to be focusing on is your uh, your knife skills and your flavor structure, right? And everyone out there who says, Chef, I don't need to focus on my knife skills. I have great knife skills. I would guess that that isn't true for the most part. Because in my experience, about 90% of people who think they have great knife skills 
Uh, they don't. So, you know, you can always get better. You can always practice. You can always have better knife skills. You can always be more fluid and, and more efficient. All right. So I'll be putting together an official post on this. Um, and so that way you have an area to, to turn in. For whatever reason, I don't know. Yeah, we are having some some um, a little bit of issues with getting people notified for the the Facebook live feed. Just reading through your comments, but um, but yeah, we'll get it all figured out. But anyways, this is why we have the replay channel, right? This is why we have the audio podcast version, so you can listen on the go, uh, and you can go to stellaculinary dot com, excuse me, youtube dot com slash stellaculinary live, uh, and watch the replay uh, later on in the day. All right, so, and you want to talk about some flaws uh, in the system. Well, I'm having a hard time scrolling through all your comments. So only the top comments are are shown, the newest comments, right? So Craig, who I alluded to earlier, who's new to the group. Hi, Craig. Welcome to the group. Uh, says, uh, have a question. I'm fairly new to cooking, and since we are isolated in our social bubbles because of COVID, I don't have access to another experienced chef or taster. So when trying a new sauce, a hollandaise, for example, I don't have a baseline for what a good hollandaise is supposed to taste like or reduction sauce, etc. So how do I figure out what it is supposed to taste like uh, so I know what adjustments I need to make uh, so it suits my palate? Uh, thanks in advance. Sorry for the long question. Regards. Well, that's actually a great question, and I get this question in v- many different forms. Um, so it's it's really a um, a, a very commonly uh, asked subject because it's how do you actually develop your palate without knowing what something is supposed to taste like? And there's a couple of tricks. So number one, um, the obvious thing is is basically finding a good example of it out in the wild, right? And I know you're. Uh, question is framed with COVID, meaning you can't really go to, to restaurants in your area or it's just more difficult to do so. But that's step number one, right? But also, too, in uh, in our in, in, in ethics for flavor, we talk a lot about the primary ingredient, right? And the primary ingredient is always the the main ingredient or what we call the money ingredient in your dish. And the basic philosophy around this primary ingredient is everything else that you add uh, to that primary is there to enhance it, all right? Uh, it's, uh, it, and if it doesn't enhance it, if it doesn't make it taste better, then it doesn't belong, okay? And we, so we call those enhancements, we call those secondary ingredients. So you look at something like a hollandaise, what would you say your primary ingredient is? Well, for me... Even if I don't know what a hollandaise is, at first blush, I'm thinking to myself, well, it has to be butter, right? And whether it's clarified or whole butter that's melted, it has to be butter. Uh, because a good, ho- I mean, because the predominant, the, the largest measurement uh, in that sauce is butter, right? Go figure, right? But you start at, at that, right? It's basically you start at first principles for any dish, uh, any given sauce, anything that you're trying to decode. And this uh, same method that I'm about to walk you through is actually how, you know, you can decode a lot of dishes and, and do pretty good replicas without ever even uh, tasting that specific dish. Because at the end of the day, regardless of how close you get to the original, you're always going to want to tweak that dish for your own personal taste, right? So, we start at first principles. We say, we have this hollandaise here. It looks like hollandaise, which I've never made, has a lot of butter in it. So I'm just going to say that butter is the primary ingredient. And now I'm going to start uh, painting basic flavor structure over the top or my understanding of basic flavor structure over the top. So what is butter? Well, butter is delicious, right? But it's also a fat. So what do we know about fat? Well, just like we talked about in our Greek salad segment for your homework assignment, we know that fat adds roundness. It also will absorb flavors and allow for uh, uh, aroma molecules to be dissolved to uh, to give off those flavors when you eat them. 
but also it sits on your palate. It coats your palate and it mutes it. Okay. Also, too, what's one of the what's a a, a flaw with using just melted butter? Well, melted butter is delicious, but it doesn't really cling to things. It's not a sauce consistency. We talk a lot about nappe, which is your basic first stage of thickness for a sauce. So nappe means it can uh, coat the back of a spoon, right, just with a light glaze. So if I were to make, say, an, an eggs benedict and pour uh, some just melted butter over the top or some warm clarified butter over the top, it'd be kind of sitting there and just pooling in the plate. Uh, it wouldn't be awful, right? I mean, you pour melted butter over anything, it's probably going to taste pretty good, but it's just not going to be as good as it could be, right? So then what are we doing? Well, we're adding in the egg yolk. What does the egg yolk do? The egg yolk emulsifies. So it brings that viscosity. It brings that thickness, right? And that's going to allow our hollandaise sauce to cling to our food, whatever we're serving it with, whether it's grilled asparagus or our classic eggs benedict, right? So now we know we're making a, or we're making an emulsion with butter, right, as the main flavor component. So then it makes sense, what are the other ingredients that you're adding? Well, a lot of times you're taking uh, cracked black pepper and some minced shallot, and you're reducing that with white wine. So the white wine will bring some brightness, also bring some acidity uh, to the table, and the shallot is there for just your basic aromatics. Hollandaise is a French sauce, so you see shallots used quite a bit. Now, if you wanted to do some crazy you know, play, you could basically take those shallots and switch them out for any aromatic in, in any, any other cuisine. Will it work? Will it taste good? Will people be responsive to it? I don't know. You know, you got to give it a try, right? You got to kind of dabble, you know, color outside the line sometimes. So you're now you have this understanding of, okay, I'm, I'm making an emulsion with fat, so I'm going to need to balance that. So I'm also going to have the aromatics for a little background of flavor uh, in my shallots and my black pepper. And I'm also going to have that white wine in that reduction, and I know that white wine will add a little bit of brightness and a little bit of sourness. Now, what do I also know about emulsions? Well, for emulsions, I need shearing power. Okay, I need it to uh, you know blend up uh, in a blender or with a whisk or something to basically break uh, those down. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the science of emulsions, uh, head on over to stellacorner.com slash FS, right? And that FS stands for food science. And uh, you will see I have a whole section there um, on uh, emulsions, and I'm bringing you through it. So if you go to the first one on that page, what is an emulsion, a cook's guide, it's a four-part series um, that I would highly recommend you watch because this will basically break down uh, all the science of an emulsion, sort of the pitfalls, because once you understand uh, the science and the pitfalls, uh, you can keep yourself from getting into trouble, Right. And what you'll learn uh, in this segment in, in when we talk about emulsifications is that hot emulsions are a pain in the ass, right? Well, not really, but they're more finicky. It's a lot easier to make a, uh, a, a hollandaise, or excuse me, so it's a lot easier to make a stable mayonnaise than it is to make a hollandaise that you have to hold warm, especially if you're holding it in a professional environment uh, for you know an hour or two, right? Because it's more likely for your emulsification to break. So you have the egg yolk, which is working as your emulsifier. You have your aromatics, your white wine, and then you're basically streaming in your melted butter, your clarified butter to make that emulsification with not only the egg yolk, but also the little bit of liquid that's in your white wine. And then you're doing final seasoning, right? Remember we were talking about you add your fat first, right? Well, we've already added all of our fat, which is the butter. Okay. So that's in there. So now what do we want to do? Well, we first, we want to bring some brightness to everything. So we're going to add in an acid. Now I like to add uh, lemon juice to mine, but also too, what else cuts through fat? Well, bitter cuts through fat and also spice, heat, piquancy cuts through fat. All right. So that's why you'll see uh, tr traditional recipes call for a little bit of cayenne and just a little bit. So if you taste a hollandaise, it shouldn't taste spicy. So if you add too much cayenne, it shouldn't taste spicy, right? Or if you add too much cayenne and it tastes spicy, then you know that you've added too much, right? That's a good reference point. And if you like a spicy hollandaise, which is kind of weird, especially if you're eating it for breakfast in the morning, uh, then more power to you, right? But you add just that little bit of a pinch and it really teaches you how a tiny bit of heat 
can help to really balance the uh, the overall flavor structure of a dish with a lot of fat in it, right? So as you're going through, I would add your, uh, the first thing I would probably do is add a little bit of cayenne even before your lemon juice, especially if you're new to making hollandaise. This way you can see how that, that heat actually cuts through that fat. And you shouldn't be able to perceptibly taste the heat or the cayenne really. It you should just be just enough to make it pop more, right? The butter's going to taste a little bit more buttery. You're going to start to get those little back hints of shallots, right? Then add in a little bit of acid to kind of uh, do that final cut and then taste for final seasoning, which is salt. And at, at this point, and also too, by the way, uh, this is why I never have salted butter in my kitchen. Uh, if I want to make, uh, you know, if I want to spread, you know, butter and salt on toast, I'll spread the unsalted butter and a little bit of flutter cell on it, right? Uh, but this is where people get into trouble. They're making a hollandaise, they're making a roux, uh, and they're using salted butter. And then they go and they do that final seasoning check. And they're at, you know, why is my sauce so salty? Well, that's why. Okay, because you use, you use salted butter. So you have final check for seasoning, a little bit of salt, and then you're good to go. So even if you've never tasted a hollandaise before, by breaking down, by first extracting out the primary flavor, what is my primary in flavor? Right. And then thinking to yourself, how am I going to balance this flavor? How am I going to make it shine? You can really kind of decode uh, what that flavor structure is without ever tasting it. Now, is your hollandaise, are you going to have a better reference point if you go and find a chef who's known for making great hollandaise or great eggs benedict? Yeah, of course. And that's kind of hard to find because a lot of the, uh, the, breakfast places that serve hollandaise are a bunch of cheaters and they use like canned stuff or powder stuff, which is just, just disgusting. Uh, we make our hollandaise fresh daily at the showroom. So if you're in Reno, head on by, check out uh, our eggs, Ben and Dick. We take a lot of pride in that. Um, and um, Dave asked, what's your thoughts on blender or stick blender method for hollandaise? Yeah, it works. It works great. Um, the In general, the more shearing power you have, the better. So in culinary school, they make you uh, stand over a a double boiler with a uh, with your egg yolk in the in the pot in the, in the pot, right? So you got your bowl, right, and then you got a pot of water underneath it that's just barely at, at a simmer. You're whisking that egg yolk, you're streaming in your butter, and it's kind of a total pain. And you're just making it um, by hand, the old school method, and it's slow. Uh, it's a good technique to know, and a lot of times you can actually get a little bit of a thicker emulsion this way, uh, but hollandaise doesn't need to be super thick. So for mayonnaise, it's a good um, good approach, but instead of using a, a, a hand whisk, I just use a KitchenAid with a whip on it. So for us at the restaurant, so the, the thing with, with hollandaise is also part of that thickness uh, and part of that flavor uh, comes from actually uh, lightly cooking the egg yolks, and you want to make it to where it's just uh, above um, or, or just at the point where they start to thicken, but not where eggs actually coagulate, which is 173 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is where uh, actual egg coagulation starts, which is also why once you actually finish your holidays and everything is done, you always want to pass it through a, a fine mesh strainer to get out any egg or um, shallots or uh, pepper that didn't actually fully incorporate into the sauce. It's just going to give you a, a nice, smoother sauce. So for us, what, what we do to kind of take away the, the guessing on this is we do a batch uh, at the restaurant. We do a batch of pre-reduction. So we'll take our shallots, mince them up, and we, you know, we're doing this at scale. So it goes into a really large pan, uh, and we cover it with a, a measured amount of white wine. We reduce that out. And we weigh that out. Everything is weighed in grams because, again, accuracy is important when you're trying to re reproduce the same thing uh, day after day. We weigh it all out in grams, right? We weigh out the butter uh, in grams. The egg yolks, we actually use uh, just cartons of, uh, of egg yolks, which you can buy if you're in a – it's just like buying egg whites, but we buy egg yolks uh, for this because they're, they're liquid um, and they're a lot easier to measure, right, And because we're measuring that to the gram as well. All of this goes into a Ziploc bag. We close it up, okay? And then the morning of when we're getting ready for our, our lunch service or our, our, excuse me, our breakfast and brunch service, we drop it into a 63-degree uh, Fahrenheit uh, bath, or excuse me, 63-degree Celsius bath, which is equivalent roughly to 145-ish, somewhere in that neighborhood. What that does is it melts the butter, it cooks the egg yolk, 
um, and we have everything in there that we need uh, to make a, a successful hollandaise. Then we take that bag of basically the cooked egg yolk and the butter, which hasn't been emulsified yet, but doesn't matter. And we just pour that whole thing into our Vitamix, which is the high-end blenders uh, that you see. But any high-powered blender will work. And we bzz, blend it up, right? Blend it up nice and smooth. Uh, the shearing force of that blender makes it uh, fully emulsified. And then we take that and we pour it into an ISI whipper, right? Which is basically your metal uh, whipped cream canisters. And we charge it with one uh, nitrogen charger. And we put that back in the bath. So the handle that you use to compress, uh, to uh, extrude the sauce or the whipped cream, or in this case, the hollandaise, we hang that over the side. So it basically is clipping uh, this canister into the uh, bath. And that's how we hold it warm, right? Traditionally, what happens a lot of times is in uh, professional kitchens, they're holding the hollandaise just kind of in a warm spot over here or maybe on a double boiler. But if the double boiler accidentally uh, gets uh, heated up in, in, in the rush, Right now, your uh, hollandaise has curdled. So now you're trying to make hollandaise on the fly. You're trying to pass off curdled hollandaise to the chef, and chef's kicking it back, and he's angry, and you're in the weeds, and you're trying to push out these covers. Right, so this takes all that away. Right, makes the process a whole lot easier. Um, because and then what we do is if we're you know really going through it to make that fresh hollandaise, we just basically keep a blender on the line, kind of out of the way, and then we just keep on dropping more bags of this hollandaise mix. It's this uh, pre-portioned mix. And then we just blend it on the fly. Blend into ISI whipper. The whole thing takes uh, maybe 30 seconds from pulling into the blender, buzzing it, ISI, close it, charge it, goes back into the bath, and you're good to go. Uh, what are your ratios for your hollandaise? How long can it be held? Um, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll pull that recipe. Uh, it's in an Excel format, so I'll pull that recipe and, uh, and post it in the group later today. But when you're holding it at a precise temperature, that remember um, back in last episode, the episode episode previous, we were talking about uh, food safety concerns, right, and time temperature abuse. So traditionally, uh, hollandaise because they don't want it to curdle would be held at a lower temperature than was uh, considered safe, right to to keep you from actually curdling uh, the, the egg yolk in the hollandaise. And, or if it was held hot, it would just degrade it. It would, it would form a skin. Uh, it would uh, coagulate, right? So that meant for a busy brunch service, if you wanted to serve hollandaise from scratch, uh, you would have to be making your hollandaise again fresh every hour, uh, which only happened in the best of the best of restaurants. Um, and that's why a lot of, uh, you know, breakfast places move to powdered hollandaise and canned hollandaise, uh, which is why you have the current situation of just horrible hollandaise almost everywhere you go. It's an execution thing, right? Uh, now it, when you're cooking this hot in a bag, you're already going past that time temperature abuse window, uh, for your eggs. So we're taking it past 140 degrees Fahrenheit. We're blending it up. We're never cooling it. And we're holding it uh, in that bath at at 140 Fahrenheit. So the answer is, is it'll hold almost indefinitely for your uses, right? Um, for us, you know, we don't hold it any longer than, um, you know, four hours ish, right? Uh, but we're also too, we don't have any trouble going through an, uh, a canister of, of hollandaise. That's, uh, you know, we go through that pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so in a professional environment, it's all about the streamlining execution of having your hollandaise ingredients pre-prepped, cooking them uh, in a sous vide bath at a precise temperature, so that way they're at the exact temperature of thickness for your yolks, uh, blending it up, and then into an ISI whipper, and then holding it warm. I just learned this past week in Garmage class, add a little water to the, emulsif to the emulsion, just synergize the fat molecules, uh, and they will blend better. Yep. So that is, uh, and that's really more just kind of for the, the, your overall ratio. If you don't have enough, uh, water, uh, in your emulsification, then your fat ratio gets off. So that's why you'll commonly see like a tablespoon of water added to egg yolks when making mayonnaise. Um, in this case, a lot of times for hollandaise, your, uh, your liquid or your, uh, water ingredient is, uh, your white wine that you've reduced. And remember, um, you, you always want to uh, reduce 
your white wine or your alcohol by at least half uh, to get away that, that raw alcohol flavor, right? If you just throw your alcohol straight in, it, you kind of have that raw back flavor and it can mess with your uh, the overall taste uh, of your sauce. All right, so I'm going to try something here real quick. I forget who asked the question, but there is a discussion uh, in the uh, Stella Corner School Facebook group, which you can find at facebook.com slash group slash Stella Corner. It was uh, this week sometime. They were discussing uh, searing scallops, right? And it's funny, anytime you talk about searing scallops, uh, all these different perceptions come up. Um, about you know the proper pan to use and how you should do it and what sort of liquid you should be using uh, as you know as far as fat or whatever and um, really it's it's not it's not that complicated uh, in my opinion um, it's pretty simple but for whatever reason people really have a, a hard time searing scalps so I'm gonna walk you through it but we're gonna do it with a visual now my uh, my audio listeners don't worry because this is basically an unedited video uh, that I shot last week I haven't edited it yet um, but I will but I'm just gonna use it as a uh, as a visual uh, to bring you guys uh, through this process and you can see here, I'm basically showing you the, the heat of the pan, which is important. So this is just your regular stainless steel pan on a high flame, all right? And you want to really charge that pan with heat because you're searing. And you don't want to use aluminum, but also, too, I'm not a big fan of cast iron. People, anytime they hear the word sear, they think cast iron. But cast iron is just, it's really hard to control that overall temperature uh, because it's not responsive. So if you're trying to get like a big thick cut of meat uh, and sear it hard, then your cast iron is, is a decent thing to reach for. But when searing scallops, when searing fish, when searing most meats, and in a professional kitchen, we don't use cast iron because they're just way too finicky. So people, they want to have these, you know, these professional results and they think that the secret is using cast iron and really it's you know, cast iron isn't used much in professional kitchen, again, because it's finicky. You don't wash it out properly. You don't oil it properly. The seasoning breaks down. Uh, they just can't really stand up to the beating um, that a professional kitchen gives them. So this is our normal uh, update international pan. Uh, these are stainless steel pans uh, that I buy. They're pretty inexpensive. It takes us about a you know, year and a half to two years to snap the handles off of them. And what we do is we just charge them. Uh, over high heat. Now, how do you know when it's hot enough? Well, you got it. If you're not familiar uh, with, you know, just kind of having that timing down of how hot your pan is, then you want to do the water test. And the water test is this, right? When you drop some water in, it should beat up and bounce around like beads of mercury. And I think I have a better, excuse me, better example of it right here, right? When you pop in, just you take a little uh, handful of water, you flick it in, right? And it should bounce around like beads of mercury in the pan, because what that is telling you is that the pores in that pan have closed up. Now, instead, if the water just evaporates, it sizzles away, right? You see it sizzle, 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 right? And turn to steam instead of bounce around. For water to sizzle or for water to turn into steam, it needs nucleation points. So in this case, the nucleation points are the rough, is it's the rough texture of your saute pan. Okay, so when the water hits the hot, rough texture of your saute pan that has those nucleation points to hit and to steam away. Okay, now what happens is when you heat your pan fully before you add any oil or anything else, what happens is those pores, they close, right? So now those rough pores that have jagged edges on, on a microscopic level, they close and you get something that looks like this, where the water, when you flick it in, it's like beads of mercury popping around the pan. Now, if this is what my water looks like, what do you think is going to happen when I pop a scallop in there, right? It's, uh, it's not, it's not going to stick. So now, once our pan is nice and hot, now we add the oil. And it's just a little splash of oil, okay? Just enough to coat the bottom of a pan. A lot of people, they add way too much oil in general when they're cooking stuff. You just want that nice sheen. I like to keep a little 
a metal pan next to my stove at home and also in a professional kitchen. So if I accidentally add too much oil, I can just pour it out uh, in, in that case. And then um, also as, as a side note, when you're stir frying, a lot of times I like to add oil to my wok, swish it around, and then dump it out, right? And then you have a really thin coating. Okay, so now here, pro level tip, we're adding the scallops into the pan. Look at this, okay? So see how I'm pushing that back edge. I'm pushing the back edge of the scallop into the pan first before the front edge hits me or hits the pan. So I'm not just putting the whole scallop down at once. I'm basically taking this round scallop, I'm holding it in my hand, and I'm pushing it into the pan, right? And I'm letting that set for a second, and you see little flames shooting up. You see oil spitting at me. You think that hurts? Well, it doesn't hurt me because I'm used to it, but yeah, it, that shit's hot, right? That is the price you pay to have expert-level scallops seared. Now, what this is doing, now this flame here, we're going to you know either cover with a pan or blow it in a second. You don't want to let this flame... Uh, continue to go. And this is happening because we have a nice hot pan with hot oil um, and you have the oil and water, water from the scallop mixing. So you have a flame kind of kicking up. You don't want to leave that flame there because if you let the flame go on too long, uh, you're going to have sort of a, almost like a scorched or a carbon taste, right? But pushing that scallop in there and then placing it down on the pan, and you'll see it better when I do the second scallop here, is keeping the shape of that scallop nice and round. So it's keeping it high and tight, right? So again, with the second scallop, we're gonna go ahead and place it down. So watch again as I place, see how I'm placing that back edge and I'm pushing that edge into the pan gently because scallops are fragile, right? But I'm pushing that edge into the pan. And then once that edge has a chance to set a little bit, those proteins start to coagulate. Now I'm dropping that scallop down into the pan itself and allowing it to sear. Now, from this point, you're pretty much home free. If you have some flames pop up, remove the pan from the flame, right? So you have some flames shooting up in your pan because it's really hot. Remove the pan from the flame, have a lid to kind of cover it and to kill the flame so you don't get that, that carbon taste. But from here, the scallops are really easy. You're basically going to sear them hard on both sides and they're going to be done. Right now, for our scallops, we use a, a dry pack scallop. So you got some flames shooting up there. So we're gonna just put those out again, and we use a dry pack scallop. Uh, they're called day boats. So you get a so the the best scallops you can get, or the best type of scallop you can get. Uh, so these are what you call a, a U10, meaning there's uh, roughly ten scallops to a pound. So that's the the size that you commonly see in restaurants, and we're using a. Uh, a day boat scallop, and what this means is that they're not boats that are out on sea for days and days on time, so they have to actually freeze the scallops, and then they dry pack them, all right? So what that means is you don't have these waterlogged scallops. However, waterlogging isn't just uh, your only problem, right? And I saw people talk about, well, you got to use dry pack scallops uh, in the form, but you know what we do with our scallops? We brine them. Yeah, no shit. We brine our scallops uh, in our standard 5% brine, 3% salt, a uh, half percent baking soda just for 30 minutes. And that's what we do for most of our fish. And by brining, you, you do add a little bit more moisture in it, right? So we're basically soaking them in a water solution. But what that does as well is it actually um, it keeps the, the little bit of fat that you have in your scallop or in your fish, like your salmon or your halibut, it keeps it from leaching out. Uh, and once that fat is gone... Uh, it's, it's, you're going to have dry scallops. You're going to have dry fish. So it's not just the moisture content, uh, in your, uh, scallop or in your fish that is, uh, messing up your sear. It's your technique, right? You're not using the, uh, you're not using the proper pan. You're not getting your pan hot enough before you're adding your oil. You're not adding just a little splash of oil. All right. So now you can see here, we're going to get to the point where it comes time to flip it. Now, here's another thing, right? If you go to flip your fish or you go to flip your scalp or really any protein and it's sticking on you, assuming you follow the proper heat up technique, right? So you got your pan nice and hot. Uh, you added your uh, thin uh, oil, at your thin little layer of oil after uh, you got that pan nice and hot, not before, right? And then you're searing your protein. You go to, to check it. It sticks on you. That's telling you that it's not done searing yet. When it's done searing, it'll actually release from the pan. Now, another trick for getting a good hard sear is let's back up here for a second. What you're looking for here is this. 
right? You're looking for brown edges before you even think about flipping. If these edges here aren't brown, then your scallop's not brown. Now, every single time you break contact with that pan, the weaker your sear is going to be. So this is why you get the best sears, especially when you're, uh, like, for fish. So when we're pan roasting fish, and again, if you go to stellacorn.com slash CKS, or excuse me, stellacorn.com slash CT for, uh, for cooking technique, look up the, the pan roasted salmon, the pan roasted halibut, and these are good additions to uh, your Greek salad uh, homework that I, assignment that I gave you. You'll notice that we're always looking for that brown edge before we sink it into the oven, and we never flip it. We never break that contact, and that's how you get that perfectly even sear. Now, if you start getting nervous and start checking your scallops or start checking your fish um, by flipping it or peeking underneath it before the sear has a chance to set, you're never going to get that nice even sear. So watch when we go to flip these scallops. Also, too, notice the pan size, right? The pan is just large enough to fit a couple of scallops. That's because if you have a really large pan, as we talk about in our, in our boot camp curriculum, so let's say this was a 12-inch pan. What happens is when you charge that pan, it's going to be evenly charged. And then the moment you add in those scallops or whatever you're cooking right in the center, the coldness from your protein or whatever it is you're cooking is going to dissipate into the pan and cool off those areas while the exterior continues to charge with heat. So this is how you get blonde or under-seared centers of proteins and then burnt or scorched edges. It's because your pan is too large for the protein that you're cooking. Okay, so now we're gonna go, we're gonna flip this with tongs. Be careful, okay, these are delicate. I'm not squeezing the shit out of these guys, right? I'm flipping them nice and gentle. Look at that beautiful crust, right? Look at that, come on now. That is a beautifully seared scallop, right? And simple, okay? Now we're gonna go ahead and flip the other one. And then again, so see this guy sticking on me a little bit, right? I'm like, uh, are you done searing? Probably not. So I'm gonna stick it back for just a second, right? But then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna attack it from the other side. You never wanna force it, okay? I wanna release this second edge using my tongs. And I know just from experience that if I carefully just kind of uh, roll it the other way that I'm gonna be able to give it a good flip. And now we have a nice hard sear on that side as well, All right? So now you just continue to sear on the second side. There's no reason to go into the oven. And then we just basically give it the, a very simple, you know, finger push or a finger squeeze, which is how we're temping out all of our proteins um, in, a, in a professional kitchen. Okay. That's because uh, thermometers are inconvenient. All right. If, if I put a thermometer in every single steak that we served, uh, you would never get your steak in time. Okay, so you get used to that that feel, right? And people have all these different things where it's like, you know, hold holds your your finger like this and a ring and yada 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 and you know, and press on it, right? But but here's here's the deal. Uh, it's all pretty pretty simple, straightforward stuff. Uh, when you want to temp your proteins, it's basically if you squeeze your protein and it feels sort of like uh, non-responsive and blubby, it's rare, right? If you squeeze it and it feels springy it's mid-rare. If you squeeze it and it feels like, you know, springy-ish, but still a little bit more firm, then it's medium. And then as it, the proteins fully coagulate, they fully seize up, right? And they stiffen. The stiffer that meat is, the more well done it is. So in the case of, of our scallops, what we're looking for here is we're just looking for them to be a little bit bouncy, okay? So once they're a little bit bouncy with the finger test, we can let them go. And in most scenarios, when you're using a U10 or a U8 scallop, you sear on one side, you sear on the other, and then you're good to go. So once the other side is seared, then you can go. And this whole thing is only going to take you a couple of minutes at tops, okay? So now we remove this to a, a sizzle pan, uh, which is, you know, kind of our, our go-to pan that we use for transferring items. So a little pro tip for plating is when you're actually plating your protein on your plate, you always want to, especially if your pan is really hot, you always want to transfer your protein to a secondary plate like this, okay? Like a sizzle pan or even if you're at home, uh, a secondary plate. The reason being is because that hot pan, when you bring it over to your set, especially if your, your plate's already set up and you start to plate it, it's still going to be spitting and sputtering oil, right? So you're going to get those oil marks and those little splash marks uh, all over your pan. So then uh, when it comes time to plate it up, 
Right here, I'm just throwing down a little bit of a simple puree. This is a cauliflower puree. So here we're using a, a round rimless plate. And we're going to talk more about plate presentation here in the future. I have some stuff planned for you, uh, but today is not the time. But this will be like your little preview. So a very simple uh, plate presentation technique is just a center line presentation. Uh, you can use this for a square plate going corner to corner. Here we're just using a, a flat rimless plate. The fact that it doesn't have a rim and it's flat and it's round kind of brings a little bit of drama to the whole thing. So I'm just laying down a very simple cauliflower puree. Two scallops go on, right? So normally you want to, uh, you want to cook in pairs, um, or excuse me, you want to plate uh, in odds. But here, one scallop is uh, not enough, and three scallops is too much for an appetizer, right? So we're going to kind of build around this in odds to make it beautiful. But uh, odds in general are just better than, than evens as far as uh, to the eye for plating. So here we just have a little bit of a Moscato gastrique that we put down. So this brings a little bit of uh, sour and sweet to the plate. The plate is nice off of, obviously, this uh, you know pureed. So if you follow the pureed section of the F-Step curriculum uh, sauce, it's going to have some fat in it. So it's going to bring some richness to the dish. It's going to help to coat the scallop. Plus, cauliflower is a great flavor with scallop. So we're just kind of playing off that classic flavor structure. So now I'm laying down some pine nuts, again, following that center line. And the pine nuts are there for a crunch, right? They added that meatiness. They added that crunch. We toast them a little bit and they get some texture because right now, as you can see, oops, right now, as you can see, we have a lot of soft textures going on, right? We got the, the scallop, we got the puree. So we need to add a little bit of, of crunch to it. Now, what do we need? Well, it would be nice to have something to cut through the richness of the scallop uh, and the pu puree, right? So now we're going to add in a little bit of frisee. Uh, frisee is part of the endive family. It's a, uh, a bitter green. It's going to help to cut through the fat. So notice how I'm laying this frisee down on our center line, and I'm laying it uh, in uh, with three pieces or three piles. So no matter how much you want to add, you want to add three piles because those three piles are going to get us back to our odd numbers, and it's going to give us a, a better look and a better presentation. So again, now on top of this frisee for some color and some contrast, and because citrus goes great, uh, with the scallops, I'm going to lay down three, uh, orange Supremes or orange segments. And an orange Supreme is basically one where you cut out the, the segment uh, without any pith or any seed, uh, go to stellacorner.com slash CKS, our culinary knife skills resource. I have a video on how to actually do that there. And so these are Caracara oranges. Uh, they're seasonal, uh, in the winter, which is when we're uh, doing this dish and we lay those down and it adds a nice brightness. But again, we have some color contrast going on now. We're building off of our odds. And then from here, I like to add just a little bit of a uh, of a spice, right? So, so this is an Aleppo spice that I just sprinkle across the top of the plate. And that brings just a little bit of heat to the whole thing. Uh, and it also just brings another color to the plate, right? So... Uh, the, the contrast and colors look good. And that is just your, uh, just a, a basic approach for how we plate it up. But as you can see, the actual plate up itself, uh, is, is pretty simple and straightforward, right? People, they see a finished composed plate and they go, oh man, that, that plate is beautiful. How do I, you know, get my plates to look like that? And let's see if I can find a good far away shot here. You know, something like that, like that's a, that's a solid looking plate, right? But it's, pr it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. You're just laying down that center line, and then you're building around that center line. And then you're keeping everything uh, equal as far as distance goes, right? So uh, from edge to edge, so like this edge. Let me see here. So on this edge to this edge, right, it sh they should be the same distance. And from the edge uh, of your lines, they should be the same distance, right? They should be equal distance. Uh, this is one of the biggest mistakes that people hit and or, or make. And this is also, too, why everyone wants to talk about, like, advanced plating. And my first response to them is, well, learn uh, center of the plate presentation first, right? You, you can't even imagine how many uh, professional cooks I get in my kitchen that can't even hit the center of a damn plate, right? With equal distance all the way around the, the center of the protein, the center set, okay? So if you can't balance your plate by hitting the center of the plate, then off-center plate-ups and more advanced plate-ups, uh, are you're, you, your plate's just going to look like shit, just pure and simple, okay? So you got to start with basics. So after you learn how to hit the center of the plate, like this is kind of step number two. This is still a really simple 
uh, play it. We're not doing this for like a high-end multi-course tasting menu. This is just a you know our, our, our winter scallop appetizer, right? We're going to do this in a restaurant that can do about 200 to 250 covers, sometimes 300, sometimes 400, right, uh, when we're not in COVID. So we have to make sure that our plate up is appropriate for our execution as well. Because it doesn't matter how pretty your plate is, if people have to wait 45 minutes to get their scallop appetizer, they're pissed. They don't give a shit how good it looks, right? So this is something that we can plate up really easy. We can send it out, uh, and the execution uh, is nice. So just focus on the equal distance of your plate ups and then start plating off of uh, center lines. Now, again, we will be getting uh, into plate. I will be doing a whole section uh, on plate ups later on. Uh, but that gives you an idea of not only how we actually sear a scallop uh, in a professional kitchen, but also, too, how we would uh, execute and move to the plate. So when actually executing this dish, right, when, we, when we get an order for a timing purpose, uh, if, say, we have some salads uh, that, we, that are being made and the scallops or, and the salads aren't ready, or maybe there's another appetizer coming from another section of the kitchen um, and the scallops are beating them to the window, that sizzle pan that has the scallops on it, so we sear the scallops, we remove them from the pan, we put them on the sizzle pan, and then you want to know your little hot spots in your kitchen. So in a professional kitchen, you have hot spots all over the place, right? So above your stove, behind your stove, to the edge of your stove, right? In your home kitchen, the same thing kind of happens. Um, now, if you have uh, like a combi oven, like the Anova we've been talking about, those are great for holding things, right? You want to uh, set it at like, you know, 140 Fahrenheit for, you know, 30% humidity, and you're going to be good to go. Uh, and you can hold it there for a few minutes. Now, a lot of times, though, I'll just stick this uh, on the back left corner of my stove if I'm at home, right? And then I'll keep it warm. And also, too, just get in the habit of when you're actually executing a meal for people, right? So not just your normal at home sort of, I'm going to cook some, you know, roasted chicken and have some rice and it's going to be my healthy meal. But say you're trying to do like a scallop appetizer and then maybe like a, you know, pan roasted steak or something for a main course. You're having some people over. Even if you don't think you need your oven, turn your oven on and, and hold your oven at around 400, 450 ish. Because if at any point these scallops get cold, they're already on the sizzle pan. You flash them in the oven, right? Quick little flash. Uh, it just brings up the exterior temperature a little bit. So then when you place them on the plate, they're good to go. Now, this whole thing is built really quickly. We already have the plate. We lay down the sauce, right? We can lay down the gastrique around our uh, cauliflower puree. We put the scallops on top, the frisee, the orange, the pine nuts, the little sprinkle of the Aleppo spice. It all happens really, really quickly. Okay, so again, it's not just enough to be able to build beautiful, clean plates, uh, but you have to be able to execute that plate uh, as well. It doesn't matter how beautiful your plate is. Uh, the scallops need to come out hot, uh, and they need to come out quick. It's an appetizer, right? It's a lead-in. All right, all right. Uh, reviewing your comments here. Yeah, two scallops aren't enough for me. You know, I actually, I'm a big fan of scallops, but I can't eat scallops as an entree. Like, uh, they're just a little bit too rich. Like, three is great. Um, but every time I order, like, a scallop entree where they give you, like, five or six, uh, I always regret it. It's just, it's it's too much, uh, too much scallop for me. I like them as an appetizer. Okay, cool. So I think that was that was a fun one. That was a good episode. All right, we got through and did some uh, uh, a, a little tutorial here on how to uh, sear scallops. All right, and you have your first homework assignment, which is the Greek salad concept. So again, concept. The whole purpose behind this is I want you to uh, get your knife skills down. And I want you to really focus on the efficiency of your knife skills. Drill, drill, drill. And again, like we talked about in other episodes, right? The more you do something, the better you're going to get at it. So don't have ADD. Drill, drill, drill your knife skills, right? Drill your dice. Drill your, uh, drill, drill your julienne. And then go through that dressing process of adding and painting your flavor structure over the top. And within the, the Stella Chlorine Facebook group, I want to, I, I'm expecting to see a lot of Greek salad style posts, a lot of salsa style posts, a lot of chutney style posts, things that are showing off your, your dice and your julienne and how you're building your flavor structure. All right. Um, oh, Monty asks, no salt directly on the scallop. Nope, because we've already brined the, uh, the scallop. So the scallop is uh, plenty uh, salty. So again, that's our 5% brine. Uh, but you, if it tastes under season to you, you can uh, add a little bit of finishing salt. Um, but 
the um, also too when you when you brine your meats. So number one, we're doing the alkaline brine, which is there again for the tenderness, but also for what? For Maillard reaction, for the actual browning, right? So you raise the pH of something by adding uh, alkalinity uh, to to it. Uh, it's going to brown easier. Okay. So uh, the actual, by raising the pH of the scallop, it helps to tenderize it a little bit, but that's not really necessary because scallops are already tender, but it also helps with the, uh, the Maillard reaction and, uh, and getting that brown crust. So for us, a lot of times when we uh, brine meats, we don't actually season them uh, on the line because you have that baseline seasoning, but also to salt and especially pepper get in the way of your beautiful sear. So like for salmon, right? We brine our salmon 30 to 45 minutes in our 5% brine, 3% sugar, half a percent uh, baking soda. And that's going to add enough baseline seasoning to give us a nice uh, flavor in our salmon. And then when we sear it, we don't have the salt or the pepper getting in the way of that beautiful pure crust. Now then, if we feel the dish or we feel the protein specifically uh, needs more flavor in the form of pepper or salt, we'll finish with a little bit of finishing salt uh, or we'll uh, add the pepper on the plate. So here, uh, you know, this, we don't add any uh, finishing salt to it because we didn't feel like it needed it because there's plenty of salt in our puree and salt the scallop already. But we do want a little bit of that peppery kick. And your options aren't just black pepper. So here we use Aleppo, which is another form of just a piquant ingredient that we can sprinkle on. Uh, it has that nice little flavor contrast. Now, I will caution you for something uh, like a scallop uh, dish, especially in a professional environment um, that is going to be served as an appetizer. Now, if I were a, a wine drinker and I order this dish, I'm going to drink this with white wine. Um, too much of Aleppo is going to blow the acid out of proportion in that white wine. So you always want to be very careful um, with the amount of heat that you add to your lighter dishes, especially your starter dishes. Uh, but <clears throat> excuse me. But also, if as the chef you feel that um, a generous amount of your spice, of your piquant kick, is important to the overall flavor structure of the dish, then you need to give your servers a heads up, and they should already know this, but you just let them know, hey, when you recommend, when they ask for a wine recommendation or when you sell a glass of wine with this, I recommend something uh, that is off dry, right? So a little bit of residual sugar, a little little bit of sweetness to it, a little bit of maybe like some effervescence. So like a Moscato di Asti would go great with this. Um, and it would, that little bit of, uh, of sweetness is going to help to balance out the, um, the, the kick of your Aleppo or any sort of spice that you put in there. Now, if you're trying to drink like a really austere, um, you know, f French, uh, Chablis or something, uh, it's, it's going to, the, any sort of heat is going to completely blow that wine out of the water and you're going to have, uh, some upset wine drinkers, uh, on your hands. All right, a lot of great questions in the comments here, but the episode, I believe, is done. I will circle back around. We will take some notes. Don't forget to do your homework. I will be doing my homework as well. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in uh, to this week's episode. Don't forget, if you haven't already, check out my culinary boot camp where I teach all of my F-step principles. So stellaculinary.com slash boot camp will get you there. And sign up for our free email newsletter. Uh, you can just find it on the website. The only time I use that newsletter is to let you know when a new podcast comes out or when a new video comes out, and we're uh, releasing uh, new content all the time. So head on over to SellerCorner.com, check those things out. If you want to watch the live replay, if you want to watch the video replay uh, of these podcasts, go to our live channel, which is YouTube.com slash Stella Culinary. I've also gone through and I started segmenting out all of these podcast episodes. It's going to take a while, but I will start posting segments. And the first segment that I posted was yesterday... And it was our half hour execution segment because there's been a lot of questions about execution. Um, and so what I did is I went, I, I cut that segment out. It was from episode 69 and I posted that as its own individual episode. And it's more so the, uh, what, when I was talking about my weekly uh, workflow at home, right? So when I'm prepping on the weekends for my busy week coming up and then how I'm executing uh, in the kitchen throughout the week. So look for more segments there. If you're looking for technique videos, uh, you can find them on my regular YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Jacob Burton. But I would also recommend just going to my website, stellacorner.com. You click on the actual video section, 
and I have a really nice, uh, nicely organized uh, videos for you all laid out, right? So the knife skills, uh, cooking techniques, sauces and soups, bread, right? So you click on the little knife skills thing that takes you a whole knife skills pr playlist. And uh, there's uh, 220 plus videos uh, for free. The fact that I give them away for free, I just because I'm absolutely crazy. And uh, I care about all y'all's uh, culinary knowledge. So that's the resource that you want to use. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. And I will catch you guys next week. Have a great weekend.